Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before saying anything, I want to um, sincerely thank MCC for for the second year, I believe, in a row, inviting us here and being generous enough and having enough foresight to essentially initiate the invitation to have us come and to share space and then to have iftar together. And this is slowly but surely kind of becoming many of our home masjid, even if we live far away. So we're very thankful for the support and the uh, love that we're shown by this community generally and by many individuals specifically and Asif by particularly is always um, very, very, should we say, diligent in um, attempting to give us opportunities to serve together. So we're very thankful to you for that. May Allah reward you and, and continue to bless this community and increase it. Um, Pervez Bai knows me from about the time I had been Muslim as long as John was. So this is, it's fascinating to see all of this happen because it's a, a story that's being told um, that's not just our story, but it's a story of the prophets in general and an extension of the story of our beloved Prophet Muhammad specifically. Um, new blood is very important to a religious community and I believe is very important for the Muslim community for a number of reasons. and because of the amount of time we have, maybe just focus on a couple of those. And then if anyone has any specific questions, then we can talk a little bit about Talif's specific approach to encouraging healthy conversion and helping Muslims upon their conversion. But it's important, one, as a reminder to us as a community that as much as we experience and love the experience of practicing our religion, it's a reminder that it's not our religion. And what I mean by that is if we do or don't practice it, the religion is going to go on. And Allah reminds us in the Quran when He says, O oh, you who believe, Man Oh, you who believe, and this is very important because it's an address to the believers. O oh, you who believe, whoever amongst you, turns back from their religion. So it's not, it's addressing people who believe. He's saying, what, whoever, whoever turns back on their heels, leaving their religion, God is going to bring a people in their place. In other words, if you think that you are God's gift to Islam, know that it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> right, if you say, I don't feel like doing this anymore, you're easily replaceable. So, فَسَوْفَ يَتِي لَهُ بِقَوْمِ Allah will bring people in your place. And then he says something very profound, يُحِبُّهُمْ He loves them. Or يُحِبُّنَهُ And they love him. So it's a reminder to all of us, convert, born Muslim, and whatever in between, regardless of how you became Muslim, know that now that you are Muslim, that you're blessed to be Muslim and you're fortunate to be Muslim, but Islam will continue with or without you. And it's interesting that this verse was actually revealed before the passing of the Prophet ﷺ because as soon as the Prophet passes, Arab tribes begin to leave Islam. They begin to throw in the top. They begin to refuse to pay the zakat. And um, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq initiates a campaign to address that specifically because as soon as the Prophet passes, they begin to leave Islam. So it's foretelling the reality that there will be people who give up. And we're in a time when many, many Muslims are checking out. Many, many, many Muslims are checking out or are checked out, and new blood is very important for that reason. It's also important, specifically, it's like what Dr. Asad Tarsim calls, he calls the convert, the canary in the coal mine. What do we mean by that? You know, the miners, when they go down into the mine, they had to make sure that there wasn't toxic gas in the mine with them. So they would take a canary in a little cage, and if the canary died, that meant what? Get out of the mine. Because if the canary can't make it, that means that the miners are going to die right after. And a lot of times, with gas, you can't necessarily smell it, and you definitely can't see it. So a lot of times, people would just end up dead, and they didn't know what it was that killed them. So they'd carry a canary. Why? Poor canaries. Yeah. Little martyrs of birds, aren't they? <laughs> right? They die before the miners actually were sick. But the convert is like the canary in the coal mine of American Islam. 
we don't really know some of the things that are uh, that are happening. There's a lot going on that is beyond what we realize. If you hear about it in the news, that means it already got to the news. There's a lot of things happening in this society that doesn't get to the news. And there's a lot of things happening that are, that are not even necessarily outward phenomenon, that are impacting the reality of our experience. So the convert <coughs> is a canary in the coal mine. If you look at the converts and you say, this is working for them, and it's working to strengthen their iman, and to strengthen their connection, and to increase them in knowledge, and to make them people who are empowered in their practice of Islam, and have been afforded the opportunity to have a meaningful relationship with their Lord, if it works for them, it's going to work for future generations of Muslims in America. Why? If you take people, John's family, as I understand, are Greek immigrants. It was probably two generations ago, or three generations ago, one generation ago, they came here. But John, how many times of walking around school do you identify necessarily as Greek? But people that walk up and they say, where are you from? You don't say Greece. Right. Huh? They think you're from a movie. In the... You guys don't even know that movie, Greece. <laughs> oh, yeah. You don't identify. You say, oh, from Fremont. Right. right. Meaning, John's an American kid who may have descended from Greek ancestry. ancestry. So John converts to Islam. If it's working for him, if he's learning about Islam in a meaningful way, we've got to look critically at that. We've got to say, this is something that works because it'll work for our kids regardless of where we come from. But conversely, if there's things that are rubbing converts the wrong way, and not because they don't have thick enough skin, or not because they're just being sensitive, or not because they were wimps, but because there's something really wrong, then we've got to look at that as potential gas in the mind. Because if the canaries are dying, then it may say something very problematic about the reality for the future people in this country. And that's something that as a community we've got to look deeper at because far too often there's a dichotomous conversation around converts and people born Muslim. And there's almost a tendency to take converts and make them tokenistic, representative, like trophies almost of American Islam. And that's problematic because that's not what it's about. It's about the new blood that represents what's going to work for future generations in America. What would American Islam be like? Minus Sheikh Hamza. Minus Malcolm X, minus Imam Murathidin Muhammad, minus Siraj Wahaj, minus Ingrid Madsen, she's a Canadian, but she's close enough, <laughs> minus, and so on and so forth. The list goes on. It would be a very different situation. I mean, simply put, I wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't have known Prabhaz, I wouldn't have known many of the people in the room, if Sheikh Hamzi Imam Zayd wouldn't have been there, we wouldn't have had the connections that we had. And that's just a scratch on the surface of the impact that the new blood of American Islam through conversion has brought. So the canary in the coal mine is really, really important. And then finally, conversion to Islam is a powerful testimony to Islam as a transformative power in the life of people as individuals. To even think about the fact that we chuckle at, you know, I drank a beer because I thought wine was prohibited. People, oh, that's, you know, that's, uh, ha, ha. it's funny. It was funny. <laughs> I laughed too. But think about the fact that this is an individual who may have grown up drinking, and because of Islam says, you know what, boom, I don't drink anymore. Done. Alcohol's through. Any number of us who before Islam may have taken relationships with the opposite sex as something light and frivolous that you can do whatever you want, however you want, with whoever you want to do it with, becomes Muslim and says, no, there's a certain way that I'm going to engage the opposite sex in a responsible way. And if it's not in the context of marriage, forget about it. Transformative, majorly transformative. There was a brother that I know that went to prison for robbery, pretty serious robbery. Um, and he became Muslim in prison and had a similar experience to what John just said. He said, I heard the Adhan and it shook my core. Brother said he went to the prayer one time and the person who recited the Fatiha, he heard it recited. And it shook his heart. He knew Islam was true, became Muslim in the prison, and then learned about Islam. He gets out, and he learned uh, glazing. You guys know glazing? Installing glass? He was a glazer. But he got a job at a glazing company, and eventually he got called for a job at Bank of America. And he was installing glass behind one of the, like, um, the, the vault areas in Bank of America. 
And he said, these people have no idea that the same person who used to rob banks is now installing glass in a bank. And the only thing stopping me from doing what I used to do is the fact that I know Allah is watching me. It's the only thing stopping me. I'm still the same guy. Like, it's still me. And I still remember how to do that. That's the scary part. I'm not talking about myself, y'all. This isn't like <laughs> pseudo name. <laughs> I have a friend. It really was a friend of mine. It's a, it's a facet. It's a really, really powerful testimony to Islam as a transformative force. I just got a call this evening before leaving the office from a brother in Chicago who said, I need your nasiha. I need your advice. And you never know what you're going to get when you're on the when you're on the other end of that call. It could be any number of crazy situations. I need your advice. I called him like I said, how can I help you? He said, the killing in Chicago is just too much. There was 500 people killed last year in Chicago. 200 something this year so far. In the last two weeks, there was five children killed. Children. A mother and her child. He said, it's just too much. And this is an individual who's already working in gang intervention, already brokering treaties between different gangs. He said, but we've got to take it to the next level. And I'm just calling you to get your advice. He said, because from 8 p.m. until 2 a.m., the Muslims are taking over the streets. We're stopping this. This is someone who himself spent well over a decade in prison for killing a person. But now because he's Muslim, he doesn't even see it fit for him to sit and watch killing happen indiscriminately without directly being involved in stopping it. And he's already involved in stopping it. No. He has done more in a week than most of us are doing in our lifetime in terms of real social justice. But he says, I need your advice. He said, because we met with the brothers and from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. we're taking over the streets. He said, what's your advice? I said, well, since you asked me, I have two concerns. Number one, safety. He said, you don't need to worry about that. You guys know what I'm saying. Yeah. He said, I said, number two, a lot of the brothers we're working with are just off of parole. And they're on, or they're on parole, they're just out of prison. And they can get violated. He said, we have absolutely no intention on breaking the law at all. In other words, we're not going to do anything illegal. Because I'm also thinking, you realize Homeland Security NSA, FBI, and any other number of alphabetical acronyms are recording this call right now. From 8 p.m. to 2 a.m., the Muslims are taking over the streets. Right? And what are people going to think? They don't are doing anything illegal. They're intervening to stop people from killing one another, to go places that the Chicago police literally won't go. That's a powerful testimony to personal transformation, to go from killing people to doing anything you can to stop other people from killing people. And that's why they say about those who had a troubled past, Kanulu Susan Fasaru Khususan. These are people that used to be robbers, but they became from the elect uh, of, of the Ummah. Um, before Monica gets here, I want to say something. This is just to kind of create a really authentic uh, space. The night that John said he wanted to say his Shahada, if I would have retired after that night, I would have felt fulfilled. And the reason is this. You probably don't know all of this, but he said, I'd like to say my shahada on Sunday. And we've seen a shahada or two in our day, so it's, you know, business as usual. But we people still get excited, so everyone comes around. I think you got there at like six or something. I said, do you want to say the shahada before class or after class? He said, after class. I said, as you like, whatever works for you. Then class got finished. I said, are you ready to say your shahada? He said, no, I'm waiting for my mother. I said, okay, well, we can wait a few minutes. So we waited a few minutes. Then I said to him, I said, is your mother here? He said, no. I said, do you want to wait for her? And he said in front of the whole community, she waited nine months. She waited nine months for me to come out of her womb. I think I can wait a few minutes for her. <laughs> and all of the sisters were like, yeah. <laughs> like in a moment's time, he redeemed half of the species because of that statement, right? <laughs> Ladies, like, she find me. <laughs> and then he waited for mom. And then mom came. And she held his hand while he said his shot. <laughs> And I looked up, I remember looking up and seeing Micah across the room. He's crying. I'm crying, but I'm trying not to let anybody see that I'm crying. Mom's crying. And John's crying. 
everyone's crying. And there was this moment where I said to myself, it's happening. Alhamdulillah. But there's two things I thought after that. The first one's more problematic than the second one. The first one I thought was, how come I didn't think about doing that? It didn't even cross my mind. It didn't even occur to me, take your parents with you to the masjid for your shahada. And the reason it didn't is for so many people from my generation, our conversion was part of, who knows what part, it was part of a social rebellion. It was part of the proverbial rage against the machine. It was part of our revolution. So I'm converting partly because I want to agitate the situation with the power structure. Why would I take my parents with me, right? I want to go and say, I'm Muslim, deal with it, right? That's part of the 1990s Generation X culture. That's the first thing I thought to myself. How come I didn't think about that? And the second thing I thought to myself was, if I had thought about bringing my mother, or any family member for that matter, to my shahada, I would not have had a place that I could have realistically taken her to. Because things have changed. Things have changed a lot. Even in the 16 or so years I've been Muslim, things have changed a lot for Muslims in the Bay Area. The idea that not only will we welcome our friends and family members and neighbors and our colleagues from other faith communities. Not only will we welcome them, but we will make their accommodation and their feeling comfortable an absolute priority for our community. That's a significant shift. In other words, it's not just like, yeah, you can bring your friend. It's like, no, bring your friend and they will be royalty to us. Let alone if you bring a family member, let alone if you bring your mom. If you bring your mom, you have to roll out the green carpet, right? <laughs> green, green instead of red muscles. <laughs> No, but that reminds me of a, of, a, of a situation I had, and this is what I mean about the canary in the coal mine. My wife and the kids one year were with my mother during Christmas, and I was on my way to Mauritania to visit some of my teachers. And I called my mother, I think on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or sometime around that time. And she said to me, son, you'd be really proud of me. I said, why? She said, we had a Muslim Christmas this year. <laughs> and I know half of you in the audience are going, A'udhu Billah. <laughs> because that's what I thought. I was like, A'udhu Billah, Muslim Christmas. I didn't say that to her. And I said, Mom, uh, what do you, what do you mean? She said, well, I know that the Prophet Muhammad's favorite color was green. So we only put green lights on the tree. <laughs> And instead of putting an angel on top of the tree, we put a star and crescent. <laughs> I was just like, oh, okay, mom. Left it at that. I could have easily said what? Haram, bid'ah, shirk. Not necessarily in that order. Repeated it three times. Mom, don't you know? This is my religion. My kids are there. What are you teaching my children? I'm trying to pollute the purest land. I said, okay, mom. And I left it at that. Probably two years later, and my wife is here, she'll tell you if I'm making anything up. <laughs> two years later, I was there for Christmas. My father is a devout Christian, goes to church devoutly. My mother is kind of like, well, you'll, you'll get it in the story. And Muhammad, well, actually, I'll tell the story in a different order. Before that happened, this was really interesting. I was cooking in the kitchen, thank God. And my mother came up, she said, I still have the star and crescent. She said, would you put it on the tree for me? And that's outside of my comfort zone. Like I personally, I just wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. Personal conviction, call it what you want to. But what did I say? I said, Mom, I'm cooking. I got food on my hands. I can't, I can't do it. She's like, okay, fine. So they did it. Then, about 10 minutes later, my oldest son, Muhammad, came to his grandmother. He said, Grandma, I'm confused. <laughs> and that's a conversation that many of our kids, some of them in grad school, if they had a space to really have the conversation, they would say, what? I'm confused. If we're being honest. There's a lot of people that are confused. But when they're young, they're not afraid to actually admit. He said, Grandma, I'm confused. She said, well, honey. He said, some of us are celebrating Christmas. Some of us are. I'm confused. It's going to look a lot like the future of Islam in America. 
Don't be surprised. And she said, what? Honey, your grandfather's a Christian. But you and your brother and your sisters and your mom and your dad and me were Muslim. Isn't that what she said? That's what she said. And I wasn't like, take beer! I wasn't like, because that was what she said. Let it happen as a process. And if we were to really look back at the history of Islam, and we're now Muslim majority countries, if we study the history, we will see that it didn't just show up. Islam didn't just show up. That it came little by little and began to integrate into the society that it came to. And there was a negotiation process between the cultural realities of that country and what they were experiencing and the Muslims as they came there. And the same thing's going to have to happen here if Muslims are going to have a sustainable presence in this country. So having spaces where a mother can attend her son's shahada and hold his hand and then she blessed us with some words of wisdom after his shahada, to me, alhamdulillah, that's a sign that something very good is happening. May Allah increase us in every good. Okay. The uncle's question was about how I personally learned about Islam and experienced it, um, and and then kind of how that translated into understanding what Islam meant and what being a Muslim meant. You know, there, there's like a long version and a medium version and a short version. Um, there's not, I don't have like a tweetable version yet of that story that to try to get it that short. Because like when you heard John talk about beginning to ask the question of the reality of God, that's where it began for me. And I was both um, challenged and blessed by the fact that my household did not have a standard religion. My father came from a very traditional black Baptist family, and my mother <coughs> Uh, was nominally Christian and interestingly converted to Mormonism as a young lady. So she was a, a what you call a Jack Mormon. She was a Mormon that wasn't particularly adherent to her faith. But she was, interestingly, the Mormons, every single time my mother got sick, it was in the hospital or had a child or a birthday, she had left the church 20 plus years before that. They still would come check up on her. They'd know if she was in the hospital, they knew she was there, and they'd show up at the hospital. I don't even know how they knew, but they did. So I didn't have like a state religion, so to speak, or a standard religion in the house. So asking the question of God's presence and reality was a personal one. The nation of Islam was the first opportunity that I had to look at anything outside of standard, kind of the Christian offerings. So I first heard about the nation of Islam through my older brother, or heard about it through hip-hop music, and then joined the Nation of Islam, and through his experience of the Nation of Islam, met a Sunni Muslim named Bilal, Imam Bilal, Jazakallah Khair. And then he told me about Islam. So when I left high school, I identified as a Muslim, but I hadn't said my Shahada, and Yahya Rodas and I went to school together since like sixth grade, so we were both on this kind of spiritual journey traveling together. And then, in high school, we began to meet Muslims, and then we met Brian Davis, now, now known as Mustafa Davis, and he and I were in sushi one day. Um, there's, this is the medium version, believe it or not, but we were in sushi one day, and he says to me, I'm thinking about revisiting religion. I said, you should become Muslim. He said, are you a Muslim? I said, no, but my brother is. He said, well, what do they believe? I said, they believe in the oneness of God, and they believe in Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He left and went to Barnes & Noble, with the intention to buy a Bible. Look, he goes with the intention to buy a Bible. And on his way into the religion sections, come to Eastern philosophy and sees the book Muhammad by Martin Links. He picked it up and he said that all of the Abu Ibn, Abu Ibn, this is really hard to give a lecture while you guys got that up at the front. No one's going to concentrate. We'll wait till that passes. <laughs> He said, I'll be Abu Ibn, confused him because the genealogy of the Prophet was at the beginning of the, the lineage is at the beginning of the book. He said, I was confused, so I put it back on the shelf, but right next to it was the Quran. And he picked up the Quran and opened it to Surah Maryam. 
And Ustad Ali is here, Ustad Ali et I, and I wouldn't even attempt to begin talking about anything about the Bible while he's anywhere in my proximity. <laughs> but I would say that coming from a Christian family and coming from a Christian framework to read sort of medium is going to rock your world because it's so crystal clear. It's such a crystal clear conversation. So he said he read it and he wept in the bookstore and he took the Quran home with him. He said, but I didn't read anything else because I was afraid I would find something that I didn't like. So I only read Surah Medium. I only read Surah Medium. That was Wednesday. By Friday, he was Muslim. He went to the Masjid and became Muslim. And he came back to campus. And he's now the resident, Assalamu alaikum, my brother guy, on campus with the kufi and the beard and so on and so forth. And then he took me to MCA the day I became Muslim. So it was kind of this feedback loop. What happened in my heart... <laughs> There was two things. One was clarity around the divine. And what I mean by that is what you heard John talk about in his comments about questioning uh, the supposed divinity of Christ and then understanding Allah as the only true one God and experiencing that. And then secondly, the universality of prophecy in Islam, that Islam accepts the previous prophets and the previous dispensations and the previous revelations was very important to me because I didn't want to do a religion that was the my way or the highway religion. If it wasn't going to be inclusive, I couldn't do it. So the inclusivity. Um, and honestly, my first introduction to the Prophet ﷺ was through the pamphlet Muhammad in the Bible, translated by Dr. Jamal Badui. And unfortunately, I spent more time arguing with Christian friends and peers with the pamphlet than I did actually meditating on it. Because, you know, people would like to use those things for fuel. But yeah, that's what it was for me. Did that answer your question, Uncle? What do you mean? Okay. When Islam started? Yeah. You mean Islam with a capital I or Islam with a lowercase I? None of the above. None of the above. Okay. All of the above. Yeah. Islam with a capital I began with the advent of Sayyidina Muhammad. Islam with a lowercase I, if you understand the, the framing here, began when Allah created the heavens and the earth. That everything in the heavens and the earth are in submission to Allah. But Islam in this most recent uh, manifestation came with the beloved Sayyidina Muhammad Sassim as an affirmation of all of the previous prophets. But it's always been the way, uh, the way of Allah. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment um, to the gentleman over here. Um, one of the things yeah. when people who converted to Islam meet, aside from what's your name, where are you from, like, you know, where do you live, and so on, how did you become Muslim? Everybody has their own story. Mm -hmm. It's their, our own fingerprint. It's quite unique. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to mention one thing that I just got a phone call about today. Some of you know my husband, Dr. Nazir Ahmed, who translated the Quran into easy American English. Somebody had read his Quran translation on his website. This is in India. He's in India still. And the first day of Ramadan, that person became Muslim. That's in India. And that's just the website. So. Um, I've always wondered because I've had friends who've been converts and I've met people who've been Muslim for, you know, two decades and and I and I would never ask them how they became Muslim because I thought that well at what point does one stop being you know what at what point does one stop being a convert? You know, at what point does one do you ever feel like you know, maybe I shouldn't be asked all the time, like, hey, so how did you convert? Um, and I just don't, I mean, I just don't know what's what's appropriate or not appropriate because I figure the point is that they're Muslim now and we have to help them, help any Muslim, whoever they are, or whatever issues they're having. But just at what point, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I hear you asking a deeper question. And it's almost kind of like, when do converts stop being trophies and when do they become members of the community? Right. Because it's really not even so much what you're asking, but how you're asking it. Uh, and I'll give you one gauge. When people have names and they're not called new brother. I'm not trying to be funny. The new brother or the new sister has a name. Her name is Sally or her name is Selma or her name is Suad or her name is 
whatever, and his name is Juan, or his name is Jeffrey, or his name is Ahmed. He's not just a new brother, he's a person. And this is what the, what I heard the auntie trying to highlight, is that everyone has an individual story. I mean, you never stop being a convert. You, The Sahaba never stopped being converts. There were people who embraced Islam from a different faith. That reality never goes away. They may establish Iman as a reality in themselves, between them and Allah, to where they go from just being Muslim to being Mu'min, as this, many of the, the Sahaba did. The Sahaba did, obviously, radiallahu alaykum jami'ah. So then you become a mu'min, but that's a reality only known between them and Allah. The social realities of being a convert and having the majority of one's family being from another faith community is never going to stop impacting one's experience. And if it does, it probably means that they're out of touch. And it's something that they should be really worried about. If, they, if they're not in touch with their family and if they, that healthy agitation isn't always there, they're like, yo, there's, there's, there's some difference here. But at what point does a person just get to be a member of the community and just to be, that's what that's what I hear you asking. And that onus is on us. Is when we say like mashallah it's good to see like when someone moves to the new community and say they got a job at a company and so they moved to Pleasanton. When they come to we say like, Oh, you're new. Oh, how's the job? What do we say? Oh, welcome to the community. Mashallah. Friday night, Sunday night. We're not weird about it. Because they're just new. So when someone's new, we don't got to be, oh, hi, new brother. How are you? What's your story? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, just be natural. This is your brother. You know, we're all Muslim. And, the, and I, I think an even deeper question to ask is, how many of our youth are having conversion experiences that are born Muslim? That are born Muslim and Muslim families. I know Muslim families that don't even know that their children are atheists. They'll get up and pray with them, but they don't even know that the kids don't even believe in Allah. So how many Muslim kids from Muslim families are basically converts once the light goes off? May Allah make it easy for all of us.